Today we have the pleasure to have uh, Bruno uh, Correa, Assistant Professor at the Laboratory of Protein Design and Immunoengineering of the EPFL here in Lausanne. Bruno uh, holds a Bachelor in Chemistry obtained in Portugal, and in 2010 uh, he completed his PhD in Computational Biology, having, uh, after having spent some years at the uh, Instituto uh, Kulbenkian uh, Ciencia in Oeira, sorry, and at the University of Washington in Seattle in the U.S., um, where he was also uh, a research assistant uh, until 2011. And uh, over there, he developed computational flexible backbone design methodologies for immunogen design. And from 2011 to uh, 2015, Bruno worked on the development, development of world protein small molecule fragment-based screening methods in the Scripps Research Institute in La, La Jolla in the U.S. And from 2015, uh, he is assistant professor in bioengineering here at the EPFL, and as well uh, as um, a group leader at the uh, SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. Uh, computational and experimental techniques to manipulate protein structure and function hold the potential to make uh, transformative contribution in most, the most diverse scientific domains. Uh, Bruno's laboratory develops and applies protein computational methodology to uh, design novel functional and therapeutic prote proteins. And the assessment of the computational uh, work is carried by the experimental arm of the laboratory, where uh, the testing of the computationally generated hypothesis is performed. And today, Bruno will tell us more about the computational design of the functional uh, proteins for biomedicine. Thank you again, Bruno, for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Okay, good. So, thank you so much for the introduction. I guess. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's not really very far away from where I work, but somehow I don't get to come here very often. So but let's see. So the first disclaimer that I want to do before I start my talk is that this is the third hour of lecture that I'm doing today. So if in the middle of the presentation I pass out and fell in the floor, you know, this is to be expected, okay? So but hopefully nothing's going to happen. So let's see. But let me tell you a little bit about the activities that we've been developing here um, at EPFL and when we started, uh, or when I started my own independent research group. And so sort of like I gave it a broad title because we have um, a little bit of, um, how should I say this, um, explorations going in, in, a different kind, in, in different kinds of domains. But so, so today, sort of like what we're going to hear about here is, re is related to um, structure-based computational protein design, and I'm just going to give you a very, very brief introduction about what do I mean by structure-based um, computational design. And then I'll tell you about um, one of the main applications of the lab, which is essentially comes from uh, a lot of uh, the work that I've done in the past, and that we're trying to push forward in trying to design computationally this, uh, what we call the epitope-focused immunogens for vaccine development. And then uh, to finish up, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the new uh, branch of research that we have in the lab, which is more related to designing proteins which can be used um, to control cellular activities. Okay, so <clears throat> computational protein design, right? So often when you think about proteins, um, or most of us, we actually think about them as sort of like single entities which um, arrive to us and there, there's not much we can do with them, or they are what they are and we just, we just, we just do what we can with them. But if we think about proteins, in fact, what they have, they do have an evolutionary history, uh, which arises from the different uh, organisms that they came from and the different conditions that they have. And this essentially shapes their structure and function. So when we're, when we're talking about protein design, um, the idea is, in fact, to forget about this evolutionary history and make these proteins do what we want rather than what they were evolved to do. So how do we do this? So in the end of the day, in our lab, so many people do this in very different ways, but in our lab, uh, we like to use structures. And in the end of the day, structure is still, or protein structure is still um, the best surrogate for, or the best way that we can understand protein function. And therefore, what we do is we use these structures, or we make up our own structures, and then applying computational methods. And then we generate novel sequences that we then um, characterize experimentally. So this is the overall idea of what you're going to see. So not a lot of detail, but you, you get the idea. The idea is that we have these this structures and we're trying to find new sequences that have different functions um, into it. 
So now more in terms of the application of what, what we do. So I think that for um, this kind of audience, I don't really need to explain you why vaccines are important, although a lot of people question this these days. But vaccines are clearly one of the most successful interventions um, in human health, and it's likely one of the few interventions which actually was able to eradicate uh, completely uh, different kinds of pathogens. Now, it is also true that um, there's still a number of pathogens for which we are lacking um, efficient vaccines. So we're, to, we're going to talk about some of these. Now, talking about vaccines. Um, so there is one key ingredient which vaccines that work, in fact, need to, um, to elicit. And this is antibodies. So every time that we get a vaccine, um, it's, it's different for different vaccines, but one of the most common um, features that you hear on vaccines that are eventually efficacious is that they are able um, to elicit neutralizing antibodies that can um, neutralize the pathogens that then eventually will get infected with. So what I'm giving you here is an image of a protein which is in the surface of the HIV virus. And each one of these little codes that you see here is a neutralizing antibody. So essentially, um, the way that the, a structural biologist then looks at this, looks at um, a, a structural uh, segment which uh, an antibody that, that is made by, by the human immune system can recognize and neutralize the virus. So eventually, this is almost like a map of the weak points of the virus. So, but of course that there's um, a number of challenges in terms of making better vaccines and more efficacious vaccines. And some, some of the challenges um, are not just related to discovering neutralizing epitopes, but, but they are more focused in, in this idea of like, how can we actually uh, focus the, the, the immune response into making antibodies against these particular sites. And so this is what people um, call immunofocusing. But let me just drive you through this slide a little, um, a little slower. So the idea is that these pathogens can escape the immune response um, by something that it's very clearly understand, uh, understood, which is uh, highly antigenic va variability. And what this means is that these pathogens are able to mutate. And once they mutate, the immune, the immune system cannot recognize them anymore. And therefore, um, the antibodies are not neutralizing uh, and we, we are not protected. And then there's something which is a little, um, a little bit less understood, which is this what, what people call immunodominance. And, and generally, immunodominance, what this stands for is that, for some reason, there are pieces of structure in, 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 in these proteins or in, this, in these pathogens where the immune system sees them a lot and makes antibodies against them a lot. But it turns out that making antibodies against those particular regions of the molecule doesn't afford you any protection. So now the problem with this is the following, is that once your immune system is making antibodies and, um, and it's, it's binding to the pathogen, it thinks that everything is okay. But in the end of the day, not everything is okay. What, because the kind of antibodies that you're making is, is in fact the wrong type of antibodies. And so and this is what we, what we call this idea of uh, immunofocusing, right? Where our idea is here to design proteins where we can actually um, modulate um, the response of the immune systems just so that the immune system sees epitopes that are more relevant than others that are more irrelevant. So then just to finish up sort of like with this, with this idea of this slide, so some of these um, antibodies, not only they're just completely useless, some of them are actually uh, arming to, to the system, right? So they don't protect you, but in some instances, they can actually provoke disease enhancement. And so and this is the case, for instance, for, uh, for, for dengue, for dengue infections. Okay, so, so with this, now you understand what we're trying to do here in the, the big um, scope of things. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more of how we are going to tackle the problem uh, still at, at the high level. So the idea here is that um, by understanding what kind of immune responses um, vaccinated or infected individuals mount against particular pathogens, and by immune responses I mean antibody responses, and what kind of antibodies these individuals make. And assuming that then we can pull out uh, the antibodies, or other people can pull out the, the antibodies and understand how do they neutralize um, the pathogens by recognizing different epitope, epitopes at the surface, then we can use this information in order to make new immunogens and uh, make better vaccines. So that's essentially the idea. And now um, I'll just give you a brief introduction about the pathogen that we are going to tackle on. So most of the work we do in our lab is related to, um, to RSV. And um, <clears throat> RSV is, is a virus that, you know, it's not the most 
uh, appealing virus to work, but nevertheless, it's still a very important uh, virus in terms of um, the, the disease burden that it carries, particularly in infants and um, people that are immunocompromised. Uh, and still, you know, one important thing about it is that um, the pharmaceutical and the scientific community has been searching for a vaccine for such a virus uh, for more than, you know, now like 30 or 40 years and still doesn't have one. So, um, so this, this makes it an interesting target for us. And so just a brief history about it. So um, it was discovered first in 1957. And one of the key events in the vaccine development efforts for this virus was a clinical trial that happened in the 60s where um, young children were vaccinated with a, a typical formulation for a vaccine, which is a formalin inactivated viral preparation. <clears throat> And what, what was observed in that, um, in that study was that not only this was not protective, as in fact, it was disease enhancing, and there was a, f a number of uh, kids that actually died in this, in this um, clinical trial. So this has been sort of like been a hurdle in the field to develop um, vaccines that are based on the pathogen. So in 1998, what we have is one of the first monoclonal antibodies approved um, for any disease, in fact, but in this case was to treat um, RSVF, um, and this was to, to treat RSVF prophylactically. And then what we start seeing in the 2010s and, and, and until now on is that we have been flooded with structural information about um, the viral proteins and the way that antibodies um, neutralize these viruses. Okay, so in, from this information, what we can map is, um, is a number of interesting things that are, that are important for vaccine engineering. So, here what I'm showing you is um, a, structure, a structural representation of the F protein. And what you see in these different letters is epitopes that have been mapped um, to be recognized by different uh, antibody, uh, neutralizing antibodies. And so basically what this gives us is an idea. So, okay, I understand that in this red segment of the protein, there are neutralizing antibodies that can bind and neutralize. Um, this, this pathogen, the same thing for this segment, the same thing for this segment, and so on. So what do we do in the lab with this information? So in the end of the day, what we do, we, we use computational model, modeling in order to design proteins that mimic these segments, and then we characterize them, and essentially what these immunogens look like, if we put it in a structural perspective, they look just like this. So if you see, you can recognize this epitope that is presented here, this epitope is presented there, and ultimately, the idea is to make a number of different synthetic epitopes that then we can put together uh, and, um, and use it as, as a vaccine. Okay. So, to give you even a better picture of exactly what's happening in this process. Generally, as you've noticed by now, we use structures to do a lot of these things. So here I'm giving you an example of a simple structure where we designed um, immunogens for, for vaccine development for this particular um, uh, for this particular epitope, and here I'm talking I'm giving you an example an HIV epitope, but uh, it's not really important. But the idea is that we always start with a structure of neutralizing antibodies, which recognize um, a structural segment, and then what we do is we use computational approaches in order to search for proteins that have the same kind of motifs bearing in them, and then we design their sequences. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we're going to design those sequences. Um, so once we then have um, these molecules that are essentially different, but they have in common um, one of the different epitopes that we're interested, um, we can then uh, use or make these proteins in the laboratory and study them using biochemi biochemistry and biophysics. And I'll show you a number of different pieces of data today about how we study these proteins. Eventually, we'll push these things into um, animal immunizations, and the last stage is to understand, once we immunize animals with these with this proteins, what kind of immune responses um, they, they, in fact, elicit. And um, the questions that we ask these immune responses is, are they able to neutralize the virus? Uh, what is the potency, the breadth? And so one thing that you shouldn't forget about this talk, or at least about the first part of this talk, is that the aim here is to design proteins that elicit epitope-specific neutralizing antibodies. And that's what I'm going to be telling you about the most. So, and of course, that we've had a number of important um, contributions from the, the immunology community just by being able to profile B cells and, and, and pull down large quantities of antibodies which bind to diff different sites. And you'll see how uh, we're going to use um, this structure in the, in the, or this information in the next slides. <clears throat> 
So but let's let's use this uh, oops let's use this molecule essentially as a map and uh, and the different parts of my of my talk will 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 touch in the different sites that we've been doing work and I'll try not to be too extensive but just to give you an idea of the methods that we use in order to do this. So the first one that I worked uh, still as a PhD student uh, was what we call the site two, and essentially what what we did here was to do exactly what I just um, told you, and we used this structural information. We designed scaffolds that mimic this, um, this sites that were being recognized by the antibodies, and then we were able to elicit, or sorry, to immunize uh, macaques and see that as we were immunizing the macaques further and further, we could have more animals um, developing neutralization activity. So in the end of the day, what was happening in here was that these synthetic molecules that were designed in a computer, in fact, uh, were able to work as vaccines. Now, I think to give you a better perspective, because I, I keep telling you here, well, we use computers to do this and, and to do that, I think the best thing is always to show what is actually happening in the computer. So the way that we actually design these molecules. So this is a method that is called fold from loops, which I started developing also a few years ago. And the idea is that using this method, we can fold um, proteins um, with different conformations, but also design sequences that, that then can stabilize this protein. So, so what you've seen here is that we started from an extended chain until that um, the, the, the protein structure will, will collapse into a folded structure. And then once it collapses into a folded structure, we then start optimizing the sequence. And that's what you saw in the step before when, we, when we're changing the sequences of amino acids. So by doing a run like this, you can then generate thousands and thousands of different sequences. And of course, that then um, this is when, when the fun begins, is when it's time to select the different sequences that you're going to, um, to characterize in the lab. So of course, you cannot have 20,000 sequences that you're going to characterize in the lab. You have to use an, a different number of criteria in order to select the sequences that then you're going to spend time on. OK, so but just to put things in perspective, after this paper, sort of like what, what we've learned is that, uh, <clears throat> and what we started being able to compare um, is, is a very simple, simple question. So, and the question that, that underlies this slide is, is as simple as this. So, how well do we do using our small synthetic immunogens um, that only have one single epitope of the virus compared if we do use the full protein from, uh, from the virus, which has obviously a different number of epitopes, probably up to hundreds of epitopes that can be neutralizing. And so what you see here is that in this protein, you have all this surface area that can be recognized by the immune system. Um, and here, this is the site that we, that we mimic on our, on our small synthetic epitope. And so what, we, what you see here is, is essentially on the, on the right side, where um, with our little scaffolds, we can elicit as much neutralization activity in, in, in average in groups of, of non-human primates as the post-fusion molecule um, that, that is part of the RSV uh, F virus. So, so, and just to give you a little bit more of a piece of information, this surface protein that um, exists on the RSV virus can, can exist both in a pre-fusion state as well as in a post-fusion state. But clearly, the pre-fusion state is way more immunogenic and, and makes much more neutralizing antibodies than the post-fusion state. Okay, so, so that's... That was our work uh, until I got to the EPFL for, for site two. But then we started looking at different sites. So we, we start talking, we start doing work in, in, in site four. And so, in, and in fact, what we can start doing is also start categorizing how um, complex structurally these this epitopes are. So you can see that the first one that we tackled, at least in the scale that we have right now, was likely one of the most simple epitopes that we could have tackled to start with. So now we're going to move to the next one, which is 101F, and I'm just going to be relatively brief about it. So there's a number of challenges uh, related to this epitope, but in the end of the day, all that we're trying to, 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 to build is a, is a protein that is, that is displaying this segment that you see here in red. Um, so and so we, we applied the methods that, um, that, that I've described you before, and eventually we created a different number of sequences which we characterized. And so to guide you, relatively fast through this data. So some of um, the things that we look at is if the proteins are well folded. So what you're seeing here is circular dichroism uh, spectroscopy. And um, generally here we're looking for, for the secondary structure signatures of the protein. So here we were expecting a protein that would be mostly beta, uh, a beta 
containing structured protein, and so that's what we see. We also see that this protein, even when you raise it up to high concentration, is, maintains, maintains it, it, its structure. And also what we see is that this protein behaves as a monomer uh, in solution. We then also took um, collected NMR data for this for the protein, and we saw that biochemically it was um, well behaved. So that was all good and fine, but um, eventually we, we do these things in the computer and we, we, we come up with the sequences, but generally the sequences are relatively suboptimal. And so, and I'll tell you what I, what I mean by suboptimal. They are sub, often they are suboptimal in terms of um, sequence, or sorry, in terms of stability, or in terms of the binding affinities that they have. So once we have these suboptimal sequences, what we actually do is we use this um, yeast display system in order to evolve the sequences and to um, further um, enlarge um, the sequence space that we sample in order to find clones that have um, the, best, the best properties. And so essentially what you're seeing here on the y-axis is we have each, each of these dots is a different clone of this protein, so a different variant which might have one or more mutations. We, we don't know yet until we actually sequence them. But then we select the populations of cells that have improved binding and also improved display. And the binding is the surrogate for the function of the protein. Display is eventually the surrogate for the folding of the protein. And so and eventually then you do this for several um, different um, uh, rounds and you get, you get your proteins that bind the best. Of course, that we can also do different, in, in different ways and this is the result that, I'm, that I am uh, going to show you next. And we can do this in, in a single sort kind of idea and then use next, next generation sequencing in order to understand um, the populations of sequences um, that exist in, in, in this quadrant versus the population of sequences that exist in this quadrant. And essentially what this gives you is if you have a sequence that is highly um, overpopulated in this quadrant, it means that this sequence binds better than sequences that appear a lot in this quadrant. So it's, it's relatively simple. But what you can then do is to actually um, map the, the mutations that you, that you are observing. So let's see, so here we did this particular kind of experiment, and then we mapped which kind of mutants we were seeing and, and how often they were being shown. And from this data, what we could see is that, for instance, mutants in position 20, it really doesn't matter which mutants are, but if you mutate this, this protein from is uh, native um, aspartate, or glutamate in this case, um, to any other thing, this would seem to make uh, a protein that would bind best. And eventually we end up doing um, the experiments and that is exactly what we see. So we started from a computational design that would bind to the antibody of interest, 80 micromolar, and then we could, with only two mutations, we could actually bring it down as low as 60 nanomolar, uh, which is now the affinity that um, is the target, is very close to the target between the antibody and uh, the native um, immunogen. Okay, so that's what we did for 101F. So, and this is still ongoing work, but then of course that uh, one of the epitopes that we were more interested in for a number of different reasons, mostly because the structural complexity was also very high, um, and in terms of um, um, <clears throat> the methodology developments that it would force us um, would, would also be more, more demanding. So this is the D25 epitope. And so, so here, the reason why I say that this um, uh, structural complexity is higher is because rather than having one single segment of structure, in fact, if you want to mimic this epitope, you have to put two, sing two different segments of structure which have to be in the right three-dimensional orientation. So to do this, we actually had to come up with, with a different method than, than what we were using before, or at least in addition to the method. And the idea here is that um, while in the previous methods, what I was telling you is that if we need to find proteins that have these structural motifs, we go to databases and search for them. With this method, our idea is that we don't go to any database, we just assemble them in the computer, and then we design them, and we see what comes out of it. And so, and how do we do this, right? So, overall, the idea is that we start by doing, very simply, laying out the, the 2D topologies that could be um, possible for a particular protein fold. So let me just give you the simplest example that I have here. So here what you see is the loop and the helix of the epitope which are represented here and you can see them here in the same color. And what we're trying to do in this protein is to put two helices in the back that support this, this structure. Now of course that there's a number of different ways, there's a number of different topologies that, that you can design or assemble um, with these with four different elements of, of, of secondary structure. 
So for this, in fact, we, we, we leveraged one um, scheme that allows us to just very quickly um, enumerate all the possible to topologies based on, on, um, on a string enumeration system. So we use strings, and from these strings, we can then um, just make all the possible combinations and connectivities, and then we can reconstruct from the strings um, the, the topologies that we want. Um, so, but once we have that, that information, then it's time to actually go from the 2D space to the 3D space. And so, and this is what, what we do around here. So then we have to, to, to start working uh, with the structure of the epitope. And we locate the structure of the epitope on the three-dimensional space, on the, uh, the y-axis. axis. Um, and then we start placing different secondary structure elements, which were determined by our 2D topologies. Once we have this, then we can drive spatial constraints, and we can use the same methods that I've told you before in order to do folding and design of the proteins. So and that's, that's, that's essentially you know, an overview of the, of the new methods and the new ways that we're following in order to design proteins. So here, let me tell you about one example that we have for a protein which we designed four helices in the back. Um, here is the epitope and another one um, there on the side in order to support um, the epitope itself. So again, we designed a, a number of different sequences. In this case, we designed around 10, and two of them were expressed and purified. So we could actually study them biochemically um, using size exclusion chromatography and, and, and light scatter. We could also see that the proteins, even when you um, raise the temperature up to 90, they were still well-folded and stable. And more important than that, they did recognize, um, or so they had a, a binding signal to their antibody of interest. And here is just a mutant to confirm, to confirm that this binding is specific. So of course, that we were still in the range of one to two micromolar, which is extremely low for what we wanted. We were aiming for something like 125 picomolar, so a little far. Um, so in, and eventually, we turned into yeast display system again. And eventually, we were able to, with, a, with maybe around five to 10 mutations, to bring it down from one 1.2 micromolar to uh, around 140 nanomolar, which is now uh, better than what, what we had before. We also found out that during this, this yeast display experiments that we didn't need such a long protein, but we could actually live with a smaller protein. So we could deplete one of the modules of the protein. And that, that then this became our, our leading scaffold. Okay. So... But now taking a little bit of a break about all these kinds of um, modelings that I, that, that I was telling you and re regarding the, um, the strategy that we're following. So obviously for, for this strategy, we mostly rely on one structure. And this is the structure that I'm showing you. And, and this is true for most of the um, epitopes that we work with. But as we know, um, the, the responses or the immune responses, they're, they're polyclonal. They're not really monoclonal. So when you have a response to a particular site of a protein, you'll have multiple antibodies about, against it. So together with that, you know, there was also another thing that was bothering us. And um, what was bothering us was that when we would look at the several structures that were available in the PDB, you could see that um, the epitope didn't always have the same conformation. So this is, this is a little bit of a problem, right? Because we didn't really know if the conformation that we were working was, was valid or not. So this is when we turned this is when we turn to this study. <laughs> well, let's see. Don't send. Oh, it should be okay, right? Look at mm -hmm. that. Look at that. Yeah. How much time do I have? Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good to go. Let me check. <clears throat> I guess it always happens when it shouldn't, right? Okay. Well, good. So, so I was telling you about uh, this idea that you know immune responses are really mostly polyclonal and not monoclonal, and generally all that we're doing is, is really based on one single monoclonal antibody. So here, this, this is when we turned for this um, uh, to this publication, uh, came in, c coming from actually a company called Adimabs, where a large, large panel of human monoclonal antibodies that are neutralizing um, were isolated, and so and our question was 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 very simple, right? You know, so we're using one single antibody as, as, as a template. Uh, 
Now, if we use, if we, if we check if our scaffold will bind to a panel of this T25 epitope-specific uh, monoclonal antibodies, how is it going to look? And I think the answer is, is, is just right here. So if we compare our latest version of our, of our scaffold compared to our initial versions, we can see across a different number of uh, human neutralizing antibodies, we can see that the binding affinities are definitely getting much closer to um, the reference binding affinity. Um, and so essentially what this says is that um, not only biochemically, but also we use this information as a surrogate for the structure that we're mimicking. Eventually what we're, saying, what we're seeing here is that we are mimicking closer uh, the epitope that is being presented on the RSVF protein, which is in the end of the day our main aim. And so, so this is just some of the deepest um, biochemical and, and immunological um, characterization that we're doing with, with our scaffolds. So, so yeah, so okay, so in terms of how we stand, in terms of the epitopes that we have covered, right now uh, we, really, we have synthetic immunogens for three of the different sites, but as I told you, you know, the idea is that um, we not only want to do this computational modeling and design, but we also want to find out what these things are worth as vaccines, right? So and this is the time where in our lab we turn into, okay, well, let's inject them into mice and see what, what we can do. Okay, so a few things that, we, that we've learned about it, and I'm gonna be really, really fast about this. It's just really two slides. So, so eventually we had to optimize um, the conditions on how we actually have to um, uh, inject these this antigens into, um, into, into the animals, and we had to find out which one was the best, the best uh, adjuvant. Eventually we did this, uh, and here I'm sh showing you most of the data for the site two, which is a scaffold which we call FFL01, but I guess, the most exciting result is, is essentially that we do have neutralization activity. This had been seen before in non-human primates, but we had never been able to see it in, in mice. And of course, that there's a number of different implications with this, but it's good that we can see it in mice because now we can work in mice and we don't have to use macaques. And that's, that's always a good thing. But so you can see here that, uh, you know, above this sort of like protective threshold, we can get a few animals that um, really set the standard, and we can do our further development for, for next generation uh, immunogens starting from here. So this is the data that we have for, for, for L01 and for site two. But also, we also have um, immunogens, which are the D25 immunogens, which um, mimic a different site, in this, case, in this case, site zero. And also what you can see is that um, the same thing is what, what you observe. So you don't have very strong, um, neutralization activity, but in fact, it is there. And um, of course you can see, and this is something that I also like to, to bring up, is that if you use the native protein, the, 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 the neutralization that, that you achieve is much higher. And this to some extent is to be expected once that you have the native protein. In fact, uh, you have many more neutralizing epitopes, uh, so it's, it's more likely that you, that you will um, elicit neutralization activity. But so with our simplified uh, immunogens, we can, we can definitely see some of this, uh, of this starting um, neutralization occurring. So of course the idea is to put these things together. And so just to sort of like wrap up this, this part of the talk, um, I'm just going to summarize what, what I showed you um, in, in, the, in the last slides, where the idea is that we, we start by leveraging structural information for neutralizing epitopes, and we, uh, we create synthetic immunogens which uh, mostly mimic um, the, the structure of the epitopes. Once we have this, we use in vitro evolution um, to improve their, their, their biochemical features and we characterize them and then we study them in, in animal immunizations. And of course that here then starts uh, a whole other uh, field of things or, or number of questions which I haven't talked too much about today, but the idea is to figure out if we in fact induce neutralization activity. Okay, so I'm gonna go very quickly over this. So ultimately, I've showed you a number of, of different um, aspects related to how we design uh, and the novel computational approaches that we're using to design uh, the novel functional proteins. In this case, we're using immunogens, but this could be actually used to design any kind of other functions into proteins. Um, some of our initial D25 epitope scaffolds, in fact, are able to elicit neutralization activity. Um, and the idea now is to keep, go, keep doing these efforts for other um, known neutralization epitopes, and eventually the aim is to immunize with all these this, this epitopes together and see if we can bring this, this neutralization activity up. Okay, 
So that's it for vaccines for now. And I think I still have sort of like five or 10 minutes, kind of. So I will just um, tell you a little bit briefly about a completely different subject that, that we work in a lab and that it's also of course related to protein engineering. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's a, a little bit of a more broad apl application where we're trying to develop um, proteins where we can tune their activity using small molecules. And of course, that the, the, most, the biggest realm of applications that we see here is in, in, in applications related to uh, synthetic biology. Okay, so the basic principle, the principle here. Um, when we have this etrodimer formed, this will regulate some kind of cellular activity. And so if A is interacting with B, eventually this, the output that we're gonna have is an active cell. If we use a small molecule, a, uh, that, that can break the interaction between A and B. So this will, will, will eventually um, turn off some, some sort of like signaling pathway, which will render the inactive cell for a particular function. So this is a very, at a very um, general perspective of things, but the principle is simple. And the idea is that we're building uh, on and off switches by the action of, of uh, small chemicals, mostly of them drugs. And what we call this is the SIMS or the chemically induced monomers. So now let me just give you sort of like a very, you know, straightforward application for this. So let's say that, you know, right now a lot of people are excited about this idea of regulating activities of T cells. And one of the concepts that arise lately um, is the CAR T cells. Um, but they have a number of different uh, limitations. And some of these, these things that we're working on could, could potentially be applied here. Where the idea is that uh, once you have the receptor in this CAR T cell, it is only active when there's a all these activation domains and the recognition domains and the cancer cells come together. But in case you can use a drug in order to detach this activation domain, then this, this CAR cell is no longer active. So that's kind of it for, for the principle. But so but how do we really want to achieve this? So, so the way that we're planning to achieve this, uh, or that we are on our way to achieve this, is to use protein design in order to, to design these this, this different proteins which we can then um, dissociate using small molecules. So we started with some initial information from available in, protein, in the protein data bank where we have a segment of protein structure, although in here it is a peptide and it has been crystallized as a peptide, where we can displace or we can compete for the same binding site using uh, a drug. Okay, so in terms of the computational protocol, very, very briefly, the way that we do this, we first start um, searching for protein scaffolds which we can place this um, functional segment. We check if the scaffolds can bind to um, the binding partner, which in this case is shown in, um, in gray. And then um, we put the, the, the side chains that are responsible by the interaction, we design the interface and we design uh, and we select the designs. And eventually what you end up after this, uh, this computational protocol is with a number of different proteins, which all resemble um, the structural, uh, the functional motif that you have here. Okay, and so and then of course we go to the lab, we make these proteins, and so let me just tell you a few results that we got um, uh, recently. So the first, the first question that we always have to ask is, you know, do our proteins bind to the target that they're supposed to bind? So here you go. So this is um, uh, surface plasma and resonance data, and what you can see is that once um, you have these proteins interacting uh, with each other, you can see that they have a higher signal, and once you you you, you determine the affinity which we bind to each other, it's around 450 pic picomolar, which it's pretty high affinity. Um, then another types of experiments that you can do is um, you can mix the two proteins together and see if they form the dimer that you want, but then you can also mix them in the presence of the drug, right? And so here I'm showing you very classical chromatograms of size exclusion chromatography, and so. This is a peak that corresponds to the proteins in the absence of the drug, meaning that the proteins do elute at a higher molecular weight and they form a dimer. But once you actually do the same analysis in the presence of the drug, what you see is two, distant, two different peaks, um, which each one elutes at, at their own weight, meaning that the, the dimer is, is, is broken down. So this is more of an equilibrium experiment, but here you can also do it kinetically, right? So, so what, what we're doing here is we have um, the two proteins binding together, and this is the blue signal. But in fact, once you inject the drug, you can see that um, the, the interaction just essentially goes away. Um, ultimately, the way that our, our interaction, uh, our, our dimer, dimeric system looks like, and this is a computational model, um, it, 
this is essentially what we what we what we achieve is a dimer that binds to this protein target, which is in this case is, is BCLXL, and that we can displace uh, with a drug um, that is available. Now, of course, until now I only told you about um, computational models, but often computational models are what they are. Sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. So when we do protein design, one one of the things that we that we are, we are required is to solve crystal structures to make sure that the models we generate in the computer, in fact, are um, are accurate. So what I'm showing you here is a superposition between the computational model. So you can see that this one is in cyan, and you can't quite see very well, but the dark one is the BCLXL, and a crystal structure which was determined. So one of them is a computational dream, the other one is the reality. And once we actually superimpose these two um, crystal structures, you can see that our prediction matches very closely um, to the real crystal structure. Okay, and I think with this, I'm just going to close and tell you uh, a little bit about the future perspectives for um, this, this sim. So for now, we have multiple systems that we're working on, and, and our idea is to expand these design strategies to, to achieve both on and off switches, and then to apply this particularly to modulate um, functions in cells, uh, being those CAR T cells, or just simply um, protein cellular localization as being that one of the key um, strategies that cells use to modulate their function. So, okay, so with this, I th this brings me to the most important slide in the presentation, which in the end of the day is the thank you slide for um, all the work that people have done in the lab, and particularly um, the team of postdocs and PhD students and, and the staff that has helped us, um, that that own this work, and essentially this is, this is we, I can only be presenting this here today because they gave their hard work uh, into, into these projects. And of course, also the, um, um, the funding that we have been able to obtain. Without that, it wouldn't be possible. And so with this, I'll be happy to take questions if you have